<laughs> so this is gonna be the recap of how Harvey Bennett Yang entered the world on May 18th, 20th. Wait, May 19th. No, it's May 18th. No, May 18th, 2022. <laughs> At 11.48 p.m. 12 minutes before midnight. The boy came at 42 weeks. Um, that was not stressful to me for like the fact that he was at 42 weeks, but it was stressful like trying to convince my OB to let me go that long. But anyways, all right. So this is the recap. Uh, where should we start? Um, s recap of pregnancy. Got super sick, like puking all the time. Couldn't even eat anything for like four and a half months. Then the rest of the pregnancy was great. Um, I wouldn't say that being pregnant is the most fun activity I've experienced, but it wasn't too bad after we got past the whole like not being able to eat thing and not being able to get out of bed thing. Um, but uh, I- You made it, you survived. Yeah. I had just like a, a regular OB. I really wanted to do a home birth. <laughs> I'm trying to get comfy. It's okay. You want to like lean back? <laughs> no, I'm good here. Um, I wanted to have a home birth, but I kind of like chickened out because it just didn't feel like anyone around me really was like supportive of that except like two people. So I just was kind of nervous that something would happen and then everyone would be like, told you. So now that I've experienced it, home birth's the way to go, I think. But, er, now that I've experienced hospital birth, I want to do home birth, but we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. It's like the third kid because you want to do. Well, maybe. Center. No, maybe I want to do home birth, second baby. Why? Do birthing <laughs> center. I'm not ready for See? That <laughs> okay, so, cool thing about our experience, though, at the hospital was the fact that. I was able to have a natural birth or non, no interventions, physiological, physiologic, whatever you want to call it. So that was really, really, really cool. And I'm so thankful that God just like allowed things to happen that way. Um, it was magical. And that's why I wanted to record this. Um, we had a doula. Um, she was the best. Her name is Alex. Shout out, Alex. You keep like moving around. Oh, I'm just uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Like. All right. You, no. Here, come like sit. Okay. Yeah. You know, we clearly don't do this often. Are you comfy now? Yeah, I'm comfy. Okay. So, Alex was the best, and every time I felt like the world was caving in on me in terms of like not being able to have the birth I wanted. She was just so grounding and it was great. And now I'm aware that like, you cannot fully control how these things go. And if things are not showing up as normal in like tests in mom and baby, you can't just like be all willy nilly about stuff. But because everything was going so smoothly, that's why I was like, why can't we just let baby decide when he wants to come and blah, blah, blah. So it was like, at 38 weeks, 39, my OB was like, we're scheduling you for induction. And I just kept pushing it out. And then we hit 40 weeks and she scheduled me. And I was like, what happens if I don't show up? And so they were just super annoyed with me. But um, mine compared to other ones is like pro letting mom go as natural as long as possible. Or yeah, for as long as possible. So. She was probably the most lenient out of anyone, so I got lucky with that. <laughs> Shout out to the doc. <laughs> um, so, labor starts on a Monday afternoon. I had my membrane swept with my permission. I was going to go in the office, or I had gone in on a Monday, and they were like, oh, we have the balloon and catheter thing ready for you to like help you dilate, but I just didn't feel right about that for me. So... I just was like, no, we're not doing that, but you can do a membrane sweep since that's not gonna like cause baby to come if he's not ready. Um, and she was super, super careful, didn't break my water, so it was great. 
on the drive home, I started having contractions. Very mild, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Um, and then all through that Tuesday, I was contracting. And then Wednesday was the day. So Tuesday night, we had our friend Devin, who lives in our neighborhood, who's one of the L&D nurses at the hospital we delivered at. She, <clears throat> I'll explain why, or we'll explain why we say we in a second, but. Um, Cause I have the kids here. <laughs> literally though. So, <laughs> so Devin like checked my cervix. <laughs> That's how you know you have a good friend. Um, and I was like at one the whole week before, or yeah, yeah, for like a week before. And she was like, you're at two. And then in the morning I was at five and she's like, all right, girl, you need to go in. And so, yeah, I had like called her back over in the morning. I was like, can you check me again? And so she's like, yeah, girl, you gotta go in, like get your bags packed and let's go. And funny story, I had kind of like unpacked the hospital bag because I was so annoyed with like ev feeling like the world was just like, you need to get induced, blah, 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 blah. You can't go past 42 and la, la, la. And so I unpacked my hospital bag and I was just like, screw this, this baby's never coming out. So we had to like pack the bag again. A highly recommend laboring at home as long as you can because like going in at one centimeter and then them sending you back or like being like let's get you induced right away when baby's not ready it just I'm just so thankful that was the advice I was given so we go in and then we go to the MAC unit and Devin's so sweet she wasn't on shift but she like came in anyways um and so she's like wheeling me in the wheelchair and Harrison's got like all the bags possible because we didn't know what to do yeah. Three bags. Yeah, we had a bag for you, <coughs> a bag for me, the baby bag, the baby bag, and we had the snack bag. We had four bags in total. We had a snack bag. Well, no, and we had the carrier, the the car seat. We we had so much yeah. crap. <laughs> I, I feel like it's surprising because so it's not really like how bags. he rolls. We had a four bags <laughs> and and the baby carrier. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Yeah, we probably look stupid, but. So then our friend Sarah was on shift that night. So she checked us in and we like waited in the little holding room or whatever. It, and I hold on. And by the way, like Sarah and Devin are, they're like our, some of our closest. Yeah. Friends. So this is like cool, cool, so, cool. Yeah. They're, they're not just like any regular acquaintance. Like, no, they're incredibly close. They're virtually family. Um, just yeah yeah so okay I'm sorry no no no. and so it's just like funny because I wasn't really sure what we none of us were really sure like if we they were gonna be at the birth or like how was it all gonna go um and like it was just so cool how it all played out and so Sarah was there checking me us in and like getting me in the gown and getting the IV in and by the way you don't have to have an IV even if the nurses pressure you. Um, but because those nurses are my friends, I didn't want to be a pain in the butt. So I, there was a port in my arm, but you can decline anything you want. Anyways, I didn't know that. Well, I did when I got to the hospital, but I didn't know that before until my friends, my nurse friends told me that. So anyways, getting the gown, all that stuff, going through contractions. Like I was, I was hardcore contracting already. And then I was like six centimeters at that point. And that was what, like 12? What time did we go in? We went in around lunchtime. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, we brought food. Um, they say not to eat in the hospital, but we ate anyways. And then my doula showed up once we got in like our, the main room. Um, and then it was just like game time. And that's where like the, the we part comes in so heavy because Harrison was literally with me in every single contraction, breathing with me. And like, what were the breaths that you were, you were saying was like, what? No, no, no. What were, no. what was it called? Uh, well, we were doing like the, uh, no, you were like the warrior breath. Oh, the key eye. Oh yeah. The key eyes. So like, yeah, yeah. Contractions go in waves and you know, you ride the wave and I'll, I'll share a bunch of the resources that like have helped that helped our mental state going in. 
but um, or just like the things we remembered during the thick of it. But basically like you're riding a wave and the peak of the contraction lasts about a minute or the contraction lasts about a minute, but <clears throat> like those minutes do not feel very short. They feel like quite a bit of time. And so breathing through that is one thing, but then having someone with you, whether it's your doula or your partner or whatever, or the nurse, like is just key. But having your husband is just like so special and so he was just with me and like you just made it so funny and fun <laughs> like i mean it was very very intense but like there were definitely times where i would just be like on the verge of like just being like oh my gosh i can't do this and like you would just be right there with me mm. and then just like holding my back pressing on everything singing to me like and then like Devin and my doula Alex would be massaging me. Like everyone was just, ugh, it was just so nervous. Yeah. But then we had like a couple different like main, the like nurses actually assigned to me come in and out because of like the shift changes. I don't know. But then my OB came in. Do you know what time? Carson, or I don't know if I should say the name. Yeah, Dr. H. No, 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 it's Dr. K. My OB. I don't know. Okay, well, she came in. Oh, no, in. no, she came in around, like, 6. No, 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 it was before 5 p.m. Oh, okay, then. Yeah. Okay, so we were there for, like, quite a few hours. And mind you, I had already labored, like, all day Tuesday and Monday afternoon. Um, and so my OB came in, and she was, like, she checked me. I was 7 cent centimeters, so she's, like, maybe we should talk about Pitocin. And I was, like, huh, maybe not. Um... <laughs> so she's like, I have to go to dinner or she had said something no, about no. she had to leave at five. She was working. She had worked. She had worked like through the stretch of the night already. Oh, and okay. She's incredibly like, yeah. tired and worn yeah. out. And she's like, I got to go. Home. I got to <laughs> take a nap. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. She's like, yo, I got to go. So it was just like, whatever. And that's something that like, I was really, really nervous about before was like, oh my gosh, my OB is not gonna be the one delivering me maybe, like what do I even do? But because I got so educated on like the process, not that I'm like some pro, but I just felt like, yeah, you can leave. <laughs> I don't care who comes in, like this baby's gonna come out how it's supposed to. And so she comes in, I'm seven centimeters and nothing changed. Then like a couple hours later, Dr. H, mm -hmm. when do you think she came in the first time? She came in like seven, seven or eight. Now, mind you, we had like a birth plan and clearly, you know, you can't control things. Sometimes things go differently, but like I was one of those people and I had all these like card things from the naked doula. It was like, you're an effing goddess. And, like, just like ride the way, floppy face, floppy fanny, all these cards everywhere. And then there was like, did we have string lights? I don't think so. I don't know, but like the room was just like very like this is kind of crunchy granola, and my OB kind of expected that. But then this other doctor came in and she like storms in, and I'm like mid contraction, and she's like, "Let's check you," and blah 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 blah. Like I don't know, and so she checks me. I'm still seven centimeters, and she's trying to tell me like, "No, you need pitocin. Your body's not going to be able to progress anymore. Like clearly, nothing's happening." I'm like, clearly something is happening, but you know, whatever. I'm mid contraction. So I'm like, just focused on that. And so I'm just like, okay. And I don't, do you remember like what I said? Cause I don't, I just remember being like, I need to think about it or something about like Pitocin. Yeah. I mean, what had happened was, was that you were, the room was completely dark cause you were trying to get some rest. And then Dr. Oh, H immediately what came in. <laughs> Dr. H came in and there's two, you know, our, the OB is one kind of doctor. And then Dr. H who was filling for Dr. K was another kind of doctor. And yeah. They, two very different bedside manners. The way, yeah. The, the way I would describe Dr. H is that like on her spare time, <laughs> she plays like Dungeons and Dragons. Like, or just, she's like a rugby like, player or something. Uh, no, like, like she's, a, she was the kind of person that like, did you know that back in 1984, <laughs> like she was that kind of doctor, you know? And, and so, yeah, her bedside manner was lacking. 
Initially, when she came in, it was incredibly off-putting. One, Rachel was trying to get rest. She just barged through the door. Yeah, it was like, did she flip the lights on too? No, she just, she just barged oh. through the door. She's like, hi there, how's it going? Look, my <laughs> dog got scared. But, but just incredibly rude. Um, but like, nonetheless, she was just, she was doing her job. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's why like certain people don't really like the hospital experience is because it really does feel like super intrusive to an event that's supposed to just be like, kind of like animalistic in a way. I don't know how to explain it, but like, so she just like comes in all hot and heavy and I'm just like, I'm not ready for this, like blah, blah, blah. So she leaves and then my nurse wait, friend- Wait, can I, can I pause yeah, there too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like during that moment, I think here's like a, just words of the wise. Cause I think if there's any takeaway that you, you, you take from this video or the story, it's that ultimately you should have a plan as a unit right like as a couple you should have a plan going into the birthing experience unless something goes horrifically sideways but having an encounter like that with dr h i think it's very easy to get cornered and so and so it's very easy when a doctor will show up and say well hey here, here are the facts here's what's going on with you and here's my professional advice here's how i would advise and for you know mothers or i'm sorry expecting mothers or you know unknowing fathers who don't know what to do it's easy to get backed into a corner and perhaps do something that you're not comfortable with doing but because it's professional advice you're you're more than likely to just kind of be pressured into making a decision yeah. and so dr h kind of she will not kind of she absolutely had a presence <laughs> where if you didn't know what you were doing I mean, and, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you would have absolutely would have like, okay, let's let's get this show on the road and perhaps have done something that ultimately you would not have consented to otherwise. Yeah, and like, that's all to say, I know that that's super common. And for some people, they're totally fine with like getting Pitocin because they're not progressing fast enough. Like, that's fine if that's what you want, but that's not what I wanted. And I felt, there was just like something in my gut telling me like, this is gonna be fine. And this baby's gonna come <laughs> out. He's not gonna get stuck. I mean, there are cases like that, but that's not, that's not all that common. Um, and, and like, even like going off of what Harrison said, me being 42 weeks, there's a statistic that a lot of OBs like to use. And they're like, the chance of babies dying or having stillbirth because your placenta dies at four, or like past 40, to 40 weeks um, is 50% higher. And I asked my OB to show me the, the numbers, not to like be a butthole, but I was just like, I feel like that's crazy high. And for, for a week, all based on a week, that's not even like for sure the correct due date because you don't know the exact date you conceived, or at least a lot of us don't. And then like that can, that wiggle room is just so delicate. I don't know the right word, but so I, she had shown me the numbers and I was like, oh, this is a case study where it's out of a lot, a lot of births. I don't know if it was 10,000 or 100,000, but it was like one baby to two babies. And so I was like, oh, it's only one more out of a lot. That doesn't sound like 50%, like the scary 50% number that you're telling me. And she's like, well, I don't want one more dead baby to you. And I'm like, no, but if we're talking about statistics here, that's not, you know, like I'm, I'm not trying to say like, it's, let's be risky but it just the numbers didn't match up especially with like how it felt just like being an expecting mom knowing my body was made to do this i can do this this baby is gonna come and like all these little parts are gonna come together my body did the whole growing thing for nine months without any help so like how come he can't come out without help don't not listen to the advice yeah. and don't <laughs> not be steady but just yeah. understand that any decision that you make you are fully aware and fully inf and, and fully informed, right? And so, yeah. whichever way you decide to go, whether you want to be induced, whether you want to, you know, uh, or like even if you have a cesarean, like be informed. Sorry, keep going. My wife likes interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you interrupted me. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Yeah, that's a good point, though. Okay. Um, okay. Well. This is why I wanted to film this, is because if anyone wants to know this story, they can fast forward because this is probably gonna get kind of long. But okay. <laughs> kind of going back to what he was saying, like 
no matter what you want to do, you need to be educated on like the options and then be able to stick your ground when you do feel like you're kind of getting bullied into something that you might not feel instinctually is right. And like, if baby's heart rate is dropping at a significant rate, like let's pull that baby out of the belly by cesarean. Like don't, obviously you can't be stupid, but there wasn't anything wrong with me. There wasn't any like crazy signs going on. So I was like, eh, let's not go crazy with the whole Pitocin quite yet. So then the doctor leaves and we just, she said something about my water breaking and my water hadn't broken yet. And well, you weren't dilated enough to where you were making progress where your water would have broken. No, your water can break like at different centimeters. Oh, okay, <laughs> scrub that. But so, can you tell the, this part? Like, so I started laboring on the toilet because it's okay. just, yeah. So, here's what happens because <laughs> if we keep going through everything, it's gonna be too long but here, I just want all the details here's, here's what happens oh, eventually some time passes after Dr. H comes in roughly an hour passes and essentially what what's going on is uh Dr. H says hey you need to progress further right <laughs> and at that point the the topic of having the you know her water be broken or poked was also introduced oh, into the yeah. conversation and I, that was mainly the crux of what Dr. H had come in to do is, hey, let's break your water to progress you. And so Rachel was vehemently against it, very, you know, stood her ground and said, no, like, I'm going to trust my body. I'm going to trust God in this process. Like, we're going to go for it, right? Not that if you get your water broken, and, you're not trusting God, but that's just how I felt. Yes. Anyways. Anyway. So what ends up happening is, you know, some time passes, an hour passes, and Rachel decides, like, I gotta go, I gotta go pee, we gotta go use the bathroom. And um, we're in there, we're in the bathroom, everything is dim, it's dark, you know, it's me and the two other nurses, Sarah and Devin, are there too. And, uh, you know, I just start praying. I was like, you know, obviously when you're in the moment, yeah. it's really hard to see, you're, you don't know what the future holds, right? You don't know how everything's gonna shake out and, and break out. And so... You know, at some point in time, you're thinking, well, maybe she might need some kind of intervention, realistically, right? Like, maybe, even though she doesn't want that. But at some point in time, we decide, you know, let's just pray about this. And so I threw up a prayer to God, said, Lord, like, please, like, in a moment here, just break her water, please. Like, let's just, let's, let's move this thing along. We, we trust you. You know, let's let's see this. Let's see this happen. And leading up to that point so far, like God was in, has been incredibly gracious throughout that point. So it, it's been one of those experiences where so far you can evidently see how God works in the middle of all of this delivery, like labor and delivery, like clear, like a clear testimony of like, oh, like you're doing your thing up there, Lord, like you're legitimately showing out right now. And so I asked him, like, Lord, just please break Rachel's water. Not even like a minute or two later, we hear a ploop. And I go, is that pee or poop or what? <laughs> what was that? Were those chunks coming out? And she goes, it just felt like water came out. And I'm like, all right. Or big water breaking. Yeah, I think that's your water breaking. <laughs> and then everything just goes yeah, from really zero good. to a hundred from that well, point on yeah and then i just like immediately felt like i was bearing down i couldn't even help it i was just like starting to push and i felt like i had to poop and my doula was like what are you doing like stop trying to push i'm like i cannot help it like this is just happening and so then i don't know i mean like I don't know the timing of everything, but then the doctor comes back in and I'm 10 centimeters and they're like, push, and so. So, yeah, so like, here's what happens. Like two hours go by, like once Rachel's water breaks. Like time starts moving incredibly fast, but at, at the same time, like. So slow. Super <laughs> yeah. slow. And uh, this whole idea, like, remember, like Mike Tyson says, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. One of the plans was, when Rachel comes to the point of like delivering the baby where she has to, you know, the baby's on its way out, on his way out, we we're gonna practice like breathing, this concept of breathing the baby <laughs> out. Like, like, oh, like, you know, what's the difference between forcing your poop out versus breathing your poop out? Like that kind of stuff. 
And so we started talking like, oh, we're going to breed this baby out. And I was going to breathe with her. Mm-hmm. But quickly, like right in, right in the middle of that tsunami of pain and emotion for Rachel, is like, no, there's no way I'm going to breathe this kid out. It, it, like naturally, I think the body just kind of kicks in and bearing down, you know, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, and like the whole philosophy behind bringing a baby out is like help with tearing and stuff. And I wasn't like on my back purple pushing, but like I definitely, this next next future baby, Lord willing, like I would like to do a little bit more like research and practice because I definitely was like holding my breath and breathing and you know, hemorrhoids and fun stuff that is coming from that is really great. But <laughs> um so there's definitely wisdom in breathing a baby out, but like in that moment, I just, I don't know, that's just what happened. And I thought I was gonna deliver on all fours, um, but I ended up delivering on my side with the peanut ball. Um, but like my friends, my husband, my doula, and then like this really sweet nurse that was with us the last part of- Shout out the, to Lily. Yeah, the experience. And then the doctor, like it was, it was cool. And then, um, I mean, it was, it was hard. I mean, like, I smelled so disgusting (laughs) with all that sweat by the end of the day. Uh, But little dude was just like, I'm going to come out when I want to come out on my timing. And, like, it was right at the very last moment of the 42-week mark, which was just, like, the craziest thing. And there were a bunch of little details, like... um, I forget what the line's called above your butt crack, but it's, like, this thing where it's something about your baby being ready to come out I don't know but that was like the first time a lot of those the nurses had seen it or something it was it was apparently a very rare occasion so much so that the doctor you know Dr. H once again shout out to Dr. H yeah she ended up being cool (laughs) was legit like she was exactly what we needed in that moment Mm -hmm. um just because of her poise you know how she handled the situation she was just when all business right and uh she took a moment she was like grab the nurses she's like nurses come here like we i've only seen this as a doctor and she's renowned she, she goes i've only seen this like can only count on one hand how many times i've seen this and so she used rachel as like a teaching <laughs> moment like look at this ladies look at this this is this is crazy this is how you know the baby's coming out like (laughs) well and that's like and that's because i wasn't on my back because i didn't have an epidural so i was able to move around and i know there's walking epidurals but i wasn't even about to mess with any of that stuff i was too scared but like i was able to get in all these crazy positions to help get him out um i would like to do a little bit more research on like position for next time but anyways like it was just cool and um he came out sunny side up and it was really hard to get him out let me tell you and he had like a unicorn head because he was like stuck in my pelvis so that was nice but yeah and then when he came out i just went i this is like the part where i really remember i went into like one mode to another is he gonna cry um where it was like okay, don't wipe the vernix off of him. Like, and this was all in the birth plan, but you know, in the moment they don't, that's not like they're like checking the plan to be like, what are your, what are your wishes? They're just doing their normal protocols. I'm like, don't wipe the vernix off of him. What are you gonna do with the placenta? Like, let me see how long the cord is and don't tug on it yet. Let me try to deliver it and let all the blood come to him until it stops pulsating. And like, I was just like super vocal and um, I don't know the right word, like determined, which was so cool. Cause I didn't think that that was what I was going to be. And that's why we had a doula was to speak up for me, but I ended up speaking up for myself. And I do think that's because of all the research I did. So I highly recommend getting yourself educated, but like, yeah, it was, it, it felt cool to like, just like almost like watch myself just get into this mode where I was like, don't do this, do this. This is what I believe is best for me. Like you know, blah, blah, blah. And so he actually came out with like not a lot of our neck. So when they came, when they put him on me, I was like, he doesn't have any like, it's okay. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, it was, it was magical. And then, I mean, postpartum is another story, but. <sighs> yeah, I think if I were to give any kind of advice for fathers, like expecting fathers is, uh, 
don't don't overcomplicate it. You know, I think in the moment when your wife when your wife is delivering, I think you owe it to your wife. Considering the situation, right? Like like Rachel wanted to have an all natural birth from start to stop, and so I think as a husband, you owe it to your wife to be with her like every step of the way, right? Once again, depending on the situation. All right, baby's crying. Wait, keep talking on just But like... yeah, I mean, don't overcomplicate it. Show up, show out, you know, be be uh, be prepared in, in, in a way where you're serving your wife, your wife faithfully in, you know, anchoring her, assuring her, praying over her, encouraging her, you know what I mean? And uh, once again, it's all situationally dependent, right? Or, or you don't know what's going to happen. But in our case, in our situation, if you're looking to have a natural birth, like fathers, like be be there for your wives, right? Like they're, they're, it's no, there's no time to play on the phone. There's no time to leisurely look at your your work laptop or whatever that might look like. Check your emails. Like no, drop everything. And your wife is perhaps doing one of the hardest things a woman can undertake. You know, from a physical sense, emotional sense, and spiritual sense, like you yourself have no, you have no bargain here. Like you, <laughs> you got to do it, right? And so that's my encouragement. But don't overcomplicate it. Just show up, right? Like I didn't read any books on how to take care of baby H. You know, I didn't. I, I think I think in time you will learn what actually works for you and what doesn't. That's a whole nother story. But like in the moment of the birth, I wouldn't. The experience wouldn't have been what it was if it wasn't for Harrison. And it, obviously the nurses and the doula were spectacular and it was so magical and intimate. And my doula was like, that's what a home birth looks like? This is unreal. Like it was just like so beautifully orchestrated. Mm -hmm. But, and I think it would have been beautiful. And I think it is beautiful for women, like even when their husbands don't really know how to show up. But like, ah. Uh, Dudes, if you can if you can show up like like that and just be with your wife in every moment of the way, man, it's just like such a special experience that you two have together forever. And like, I'm so grateful. Yeah, and like I said, you know, and just to, to piggyback off that, it's not it's not anything complicated. You gotta look at it like you're lifting weights. Like your wife needs a spotter. Oh my gosh. No, like for real. <laughs> That's like, funny. Yeah. Your wife needs a spotter. That's it. You know what I mean? And and you don't have to say anything magical to her. You don't have to, you know, conjure up a, a script of quotes or you know. I think I think having thoughtful verses, even though I don't think we did that, no. but like having thoughtful <laughs> prayers for the most part, and like being able to just be present. I think that's that's the most important thing. Just be present. Be there. Be right next to her right hold her hand when she's breathing and she's you know doing her little key eyes or spirit yells like <laughs> you do it with her right and so she needs a spotter right and so be the spotter for your wife um anyways yeah. just oh my so yeah just the most magical experience very hard very intense a little bit painful i would say i just quite a bit but we're gonna we're gonna substitute that for intensity it was great. We'll do it, do it again. All right. So thanks for everyone who was involved. Much love. And I'm going to probably rewatch this and cry. All right. Okay, love you Okay, goodbye. Peace.